Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. This is a C64 Repairathon series, and this episode is probably, well, hopefully, the final part. This is the fifth machine, which is the one I'm going to start looking at today. And unless this machine is super broken and requires much more troubleshooting than I can fit in one episode, this will be the final part. If you haven't watched uh, the first three episodes, I recommend you do that first, only because I'm probably referring back to stuff that happened in those in this final episode. So without further ado, let's dig into machine number five, or, or rather, let's get right to it. All right, the number five Commodore 64. So as I mentioned in the intro, this is definitely a Rev A machine. It's got the gold label right here where it says 64 next to the power LED. And I think originally this label, which is missing, unfortunately, just said Commodore with kind of a silvery gold background. I have at least one other Rev A Commodore 64, this, this early version, but it doesn't have the early badges. It has the later badges on it. This machine was donated by the same person who sent in, I think, machine number three. And there's some paper inside the keyboard that I can tell was from the original packing material. This would have been one of the machines that was also found in the trash. There is a metal badge on the computer here that says St. Mary's Parish School System. So I'm pretty sure this machine came from somewhere inside Louisiana. It's one of the states in the U.S., potentially New Orleans. On the left side of the machine, there was what looked like potentially a toggle switch that's been snapped off at some point. So maybe this thing has some kind of mods inside, like a replacement kernel ROM or something, and that's what that switch is for. And I know I briefly mentioned it, but just in case you're not familiar, the Rev A boards, the side plate here looks a little bit different. The writing above the ports is in a bright white text versus sort of a faded white on all the other machines. But also around the power connector, it's a square hole versus a round hole. A little bit of corrosion on the anodized metal there as well on this particular machine. Anyhow, let's take a look inside. I'm pretty sure I have the screws removed. Yep, and this thing just lifts right off. Well, like I said, this is definitely a Rev A motherboard. You can tell by the component layout here. But unfortunately, this tape I wrote here says OK, which means I guess I tested this and it worked. Now, I should have probably tested these machines before I started the repair-a-thon, in case I get to a situation like this where I have an entire video and a machine that actually may not need any repair work done at all. Let me still take a look at this machine and make sure it still actually works and see what's going on here. So I do have an X written on the SID chip, so obviously this is bad. And the PLA chip appears to be missing. Now it actually stands to reason that this PLA that I've been using throughout this series, the 82S100, probably came out of this machine because that's absolutely what would have been in here is an A2S100. And these chips being so super reliable, I might have sort of pillaged it out of this thing so I could use it in other machines for testing. So I'm going to reinstall it so we can turn this thing on. Before we do turn it on, taking a look at the date codes, the processor here is 37th week of 1982. And that seems to me probably the latest chip on here which shows that this machine was one of the very early versions made in 1982, which is pretty cool. Also, here is this switch that was on the side. Now, it actually looks like it was just a push button and not a toggle switch. And the wires run over here between two pins on the user port. And I'm 99% positive that that is the reset line. And that's probably ground. So when you push this, it actually resets the machine. Although, it's not a full reset. When you reset this way, you could have software that overrides the reset vector. And when you push this, it just goes back into the software. It's not a complete reset on the Commodore 64. To do a full reset, you actually need to toggle one of the lines on the PLA. I'm pointing to the SID, but I meant the PLA. And when you do that in combination with the reset line, it does a full hard reset on the machine. It'll escape out of any of the reset vectors that hard code trying to get back into the software, like say it was a cartridge or, or whatever. I will link in the description below to an article, I think by Ray Carlson, about how to create a reset circuit. You can make one very simply that will do a full hard reset on your 64 and work every time. So let me plug in the cables necessary to test this thing and we'll give it a power up. Well, there we have it. How ultra boring, a Commodore 64 that works. I mean, it's not really boring. It's actually kind of nice. 
But honestly, you're here to watch repairs of these machines, right? Not working things. I have a cut off cotton swab here. Let's see if I can push this into the switch and make the reset function actually work. There it is, it does work. So I know nothing is really up on the screen right now, but when I push this, notice it gets small, the cursor stops flashing and then it comes back. So this definitely was initiating a reset. I guess what's next for this thing is let me plug in the diagnostic harness and see if everything works. I am basically not holding my breath that there's gonna be any problems with this machine though, being that the Rev A computers are just so reliable. Everything is connected, we're ready for testing. Let me power this on. Let's see what happens with the diagnostics. I assume it's all gonna work, except for probably the SID, which we know is bad. Well, I think is bad because I drew an X on it. Okay, actually, there looks like there might be something going on here. We're seeing a little glitching here on the text. We might have to wait till it cycles through again because uh, now the RAM test is done. The little glitching has gone away. Okay, so the SID is actually kind of working. It's just sounding glitchy. Anyhow, we have control port bad, but that is reporting from the SID, but user port is also reporting bad. Let's see about this glitchy text. Okay, there it is. You see that on the camera there? The, these letters here, they're kind of glitching out. Now, now the machine is writing to the RAM and it's running through all the RAM tests right now. And it's possible that it's just a little marginal the way it interfaces with the VIC chip. Because of course the VIC is sharing the same RAM for text memory. And that may not have any actual problems with the operation of the machine. Like using it might not show any problems. I think for completeness, I'm just gonna swap out the SID with a known good one, and then I'll see if that control port error goes away. All right, let's try this again. I have wiggled around this connector as well on the user port and made sure that was in. Also made sure these two cables were in the right ports on the side here. All right, turning the volume down. So the SID sounds fine, because I know this is a working one. It still shows that the 6581 is bad, and I know that's not true, because this SID definitely works, passes all tests in another machine. And I'm really wondering if this diagnostic just has a particular problem with the paddle ports. It's got to be talking about the paddle ports where it's only referencing the 6581. So I'm going to chalk it up to that. I don't think there's an actual fault. And I just have to wonder about this weird glitching that happens during the RAM test. All right, I have this VersaCart here, which has some different diagnostic ROMs. I don't really use this very much, but I have like the 1541 diagnostics on there. I think I have a copy of Pitfall 2 on there and one of the other ROM slots. So I'm Gonna turn this on, see if we get Pitfall 2. Oh yeah, we do, we get Pitfall. Or it's just regular Pitfall. I just wanna play through the game a little bit, just make sure there's no graphical corruption when I move around. Press F1 to start. Okay, well I guess I need to connect a keyboard. Let's connect the number five keyboard. It's actually in decent shape. I mean, there's paper inside, but not impossible to clean that out. Press F1 to start. Oh, this key actually is kind of binding up a little bit. So I think uh, this would need full on disassembly and cleaning to get all that paper out. Let's switch over to the Zip 64 keyboard <laughs> since I know this one works. All right, does this even have any sound or music this game? Oh, well the game is working, so jump works. Oh, you know what? Uh, did I put a SID back in? There is a SID in there. Oh, I have the sound down. Let's reset. There's a reset button on the cartridge. Guess there's no... Oh, okay, there is sound. Now this is the bad SID, so it might not sound correct, the one that's in here, but it's enough for just testing. Am I supposed to do something here? Oh, I'm supposed to jump off that, okay. I'm really not familiar with Pitfall, obviously. <laughs> okay, clearly my pitfall playing skills are garbage. But one thing is for sure is the game is working totally normally. So it could just be that on this machine, some of the ICs that are on here are older. Oh, I have a different game on here. I have Pac-Man as well. Keep the keyboard hooked up. One player game, press blah, blah, blah. Press F1 for Pac-Man. All right, let's see if Pac-Man works properly. Uh... Okay, it keeps quitting out of the game, and I assume that's because I have the controller plugged into controller port one. 
And this probably needs controller port too. So let's try again. Oh yeah, now it's working fine. All right, well anyhow, this absolutely is working fine. So I guess it's very unfortunate that this machine just works and I don't need to actually do anything to it. Uh, the SID was the only thing that's slightly marginal. Because I can't run the Easy Flash on these Rev-A boards, I can't run the Donkey Kong Arcade intro, so we can't hear that music. But I'm sure the music will be slightly glitchy because this chip is weirdly marginal. But it does work enough for testing, which is good. So I'll leave it in this machine and this thing just works. That's a piece of paper. So since we had no repair love from that Commodore 64, how about I look at this VIC-20? I wasn't intending to include this in this repair-a-thon, but you see the note here. It says VIC-20, black screen, mail call Mike. So viewer Mike sent this in. Thanks a lot, Mike. I think when I opened this, I called it one of the yellowest VIC-20s I had ever seen. Look at the bottom. I mean, look, what is going on here? And isn't it weird how the bottom and the top have a different amount of yellowing? But if we look at the side here, whoa, that is yellow. Really, really yellow. Someone has written naming the ports because on this particular case size, it didn't actually have those labels on there. Notice this little bump out right here. You see that? You know what that's all about? That is because this top, even though it's white, could also be used for the Commodore 64. They just changed the color of the plastic. And that little bump out there is for the RF modulator, the RCA RF output. So really it's the bottom and the top, they could just interchange. And judging by the fact that this is a rainbow label VIC-20, clearly this is a later one, even though it's got the kind of orange keys here. So mix and match with Commodore 64, totally interchangeable parts. So time to open this up. Take a look inside of this extremely yellow VIC-20. Oh, lots of cracks. All right, well, this is one of the later VIC-20s, which I've actually never worked on. Should we call it like a short board, something like that? So a few observations. This, this is like a short board, so to speak. So they're using the RF shield as a way to mount the motherboard into the case with a screw here, here, and here. Not sure if there was one there that's gone, but look at the rust on uh, this RF shield. So one thing to tell about this bottom cover is you can see that the plastic is yellow even on the inside. So clearly the yellowing that happened on this wasn't just from light exposure on the outside. Now it is much darker right there and also along this edge here where the metal cover was. So clearly light was playing a factor, but Look at how yellow the whole thing is. This should be a creamy white color, and it's definitely not. In fact, right here in the corner, this little standoff broke off, and look at the part of the plastic underneath there that definitely wasn't exposed to any light, <laughs> and it's also the very yellow color. Let's flip this over and see what this looks like on the back. Ooh, that is a lot of corrosion. Some screws falling out there. So clearly this thing was in a very damp environment for a long time. So let's take a look at this board starting on the right side here. First off, the fuse right here. What is happening? It's a short fuse holder and it has a long fuse and someone stuck this metal, shiny metal tape on it. Now, was that done at the factory because they ran out of the short fuses? I mean, that's pretty silly. One thing about these later VIC-20s is the power input uses the same jack as the Commodore 64. The power switch here looks exactly like the one on the Commodore 64. As is normal on the VIC-20, single controller port. Here's a little power supply. And then we have the 6502 processor under this black wire here, which sends voltage off to that side of the motherboard. The legs on the processor are quite corroded, but I don't think that's necessarily the problem. We have two ROM chips, some TTL Logic chips here. This chip and these two are MOS branded and they say 65245s. And I have to wonder, are these 74LS 245s, like weird Moss branded ones? And if they are, those are probably bad because they break so much as we saw in the previous Commodore 64 repair video. Some more 74LS logic. 
Is this another ROM chip or is it like a PLA type thing? 901460. And these two chips over here are 901486401 and 06. I'm gonna have to look up what these various chips are. These two chips here, the HM6116 SRAM chips, and they are 2K each, so a total of 4K. But the VIC-20 has more than 4K of RAM, you're saying, right? Yeah, well, these are SRAM chips here as well. So there's two types of SRAMs. The original VIC-20 had entirely two 114s, but I guess Commodore switched to these chips, lower cost maybe. And under this cover here is the original VIC chip, not the VIC-2, but the original VIC, and that handles the graphics and the sound for the VIC-20. And unfortunately, the VIC chip is soldered onto the board, as are actually almost all the chips, except for these three chips and the CPU. And usually, this was something that Frank or IZ8 DWF was telling me, usually Commodore, when they were building these, when they ran low on chips during manufacturing, they just installed sockets, put the board aside, and then later went back and filled these in with the missing chips. And typically when you see Moss branded chips that are replacements for regular 74LS Logic chips, they were manufactured by Commodore's fabs because Commodore couldn't buy enough of the regular LS Logic chips to make the machines that were in such high demand. And indeed, a quick Google shows that the Moss 65245 was indeed the Moss version of the 74LS 245. So luckily, if these are bad, they're already socketed, and I happen to have tons of these chips, so I might just try swapping those out first. But let's just do some diagnostics first on this machine, see what we even see with the oscilloscope. With power and the monitor connected, let's power this on, see if we even get a video signal out of it, because it might be something with the power supply that's bad. All right, well, the monitor woke up, so there is just a black screen happening on this machine right now. Let's probe around, see what we see on the CPU. All right, first things first, I am on the VCC line on the CPU. It's absolutely getting five volts, so that's a good sign. That's what we need to see. Next up, the reset line on pin 40. If I turn the computer off, turn it back on, reset stays low for a while, then goes high, which is the normal behavior, I think, for the VIC-20. Well, it should definitely be high when the machine is running. Pin 37 is the clock signal, and we're getting 1.027 megahertz, which is correct. Here I am on data line zero, and it's suspect, just looks, ooh, what's happening there? Okay, maybe that's normal. Let's see if any of these are doing anything whatsoever. So far, every single one of them is high, and it's weird how it's just with this little bit of a ripple at the top there. Yeah, I'm literally not seeing much going on here. It sort of floats for a bit, and then there's a bit of activity, and then it just stops. I am on pin seven, which is the sync pin, which I think should be going up and down when the thing is running. Let me turn off the computer off and on. Not really seeing much. Okay, there was a little blip there of activity and then nothing. Well, the CPU definitely just halted. It's not doing anything, it's not running. And that is a bit unusual in my book. It should be doing a little bit more than it actually is there. So I'm gonna to try to pull out these three MOS bus transceivers. And I gotta say, this one here, it's so corroded looking. In fact, it seems like it's stuck in the socket. Like as it's coming out, it's almost like it's tearing. It might be damaging the socket to be honest. Yeah, yeah, that chip's not happy. One of the legs just broke right off in the socket. Oh, not just one. Three of the legs just broke right off in the socket. Is that coming across? <laughs> That's gonna cause a problem. I'm also not totally sure that this socket's gonna work anymore because of those broken off legs that are in there. Let's see about this one coming out. Oh, this poor thing. <laughs> Oh, look at that, it's just so screwed up. There's no way this chip, <laughs> like all the legs just came off. That is wild. Now, obviously this thing was exposed to a lot of moisture, but the thing is, none of the other ICs are rusted like these. The CPU is a little crusty looking, they must have made these so crappily 
that the legs are just destroyed. I mean, look, this is another one. Just look at this, look at this disaster. Well, all I can really do is just put a little deoxid in these. Uh, maybe I'll get a toothbrush, scrub them a little. I'll try to insert a 245 into one of these, see if that it even goes into the socket. I assume the socket's just gonna be destroyed. I'm gonna have to replace all three of those. All right, one old toothbrush. Okay, some actual 245s. These are ones I seem to have desoldered off of something else, so I guess these are salvage parts, but they should work. And there we go, three LS 245s. Let me push them down, make sure they're in there all the way. Let's power this on, see what we see. Well, would you look at that? We still have a black screen, but I'm looking at the data bus on the CPU and there's actual activity. So those Moss 74 LS 245s were definitely bad. Let me go through all the lines make sure that I'm seeing the correct signals on all, nothing is being held at a weird level. So I checked the data bus lines, they looked fine. I haven't gone through all the address lines, but I'm on pin seven, the sync pin, and that looks correct. That is how it's supposed to look <laughs> when it's running. Let's just power cycle it again. So it waits a second and then it does this. That's what a 6502 does when it's actually executing opcodes. So this 6502 is definitely running. Now it doesn't say that it could still be bad. It's quite possible, but at least it's trying to do something. Well, now I'm just going through the address lines. So far, so good. Well, all the address lines look fine. Let's do a quick look at the schematics for this. I think this is a Rev D VIC-20. That's what I loaded off of Zimmer's here, Rev D. So here we are with the 6502. Here are the data lines, here are the address lines. Notice these 74LS 245s handle all of the data bus lines, so none of those data bus lines even get through to any component if this chip were bad. And then address lines zero through 12, oh, uh, yeah, through 12 go through these two. Now there are additional address lines because up to 15 that go off directly to something else. I don't know, two comma three, I'll have to look at that. Uh, a couple other signals pass through here on this 245, but yeah, something was definitely not correct on those. Now the direction pin here on the top one is controlled by the read-write signal, but of course address bus lines always go one direction, so they are just held to ground all the time. On this page here, we see the two RAM chips. There is a 2114 as one of the smaller chips. I think there are a couple more that are off on a different page. And then these are two ROMs here, and down here is another ROM chip. Now, since everything that's on the data bus connects through the bus transceiver, I was actually looking at the CPU and I wasn't looking on the other side of the bus transceiver. So there could be something shorting one of those address or data bus lines to ground on the other side of the bus transceivers. So if we go back to this page, it's definitely worth going through the BD pins here and all these VA pins just to make sure that none of those are shorted low. So we should be seeing, for instance, on these address lines, the CA4 and the VA4 should have the same signal on both sides, but it's possible something's wrong on this side. But when I was looking at the CPU, I was only looking on the left side here. So I'm gonna start at UE8. I'm gonna look at pin two, which is the VA8 line, which is the same as CA8 line. So on the oscilloscope, I'm not really seeing anything, right? But let's look at the corresponding pin on the other side, which is pin 18. And when you look at that, that's coming from the CPU CA8 and VA8 on the other side has nothing. So let's just go through all of the address lines on the other side. So this is eight, nine, 10, it's kind of floating, 12. Okay, so something's going on here. Maybe this chip is not enabled. Pin 19 is the enable signal, here it is. And when it's low, it's actually connecting both sides of the chip together. So it's possible that the address line is actually coming through when this line is high, and maybe that's why I'm not seeing anything on both sides of the chip. So I've moved over to UD8, which is handling address lines zero through seven, and unlike the one next to it, I'm absolutely seeing a signal on the address lines normally coming through it. That really makes me think that there might be something wrong with this other chip here. Now these are untested, 
it looks like I soldered these off, I took these off another board. So what I'm just gonna do is I'm gonna swap these two around so we can really see if that problem where there's nothing coming out of the address lines on this Motorola chip, if it follows the chip or if it's the socket or something else. So if I see that problem on this one still, which is, what is this, a TI part, then I know that it's not the chip and it's something else. So power on the computer. And we look at the address lines and look at that. Oh wait, the computer's working now. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, look, it came right up. Yeah, you know, it might've just been bad contact in the socket because these sockets are rusty and these Motorola chips, these two, because I had taken them off something else, the legs were cut short and they probably just weren't making good contact in the board. Let's, uh, let's push these down into there again and power cycle the thing. <laughs> okay, is it gonna come back up again, maybe? It's working. <laughs> so the problem was these rusty dead chips. And then I think what was happening is this Motorola chip just had bad contact in that socket. And I switched this TI one into it, which has longer pins. So it went down all the way into it and it made good contact. <laughs> so that was the problem. I gotta say that the video output quality on this Vic 20 looks really good. Like the, the text here, it's not fringy or, or any weirdness like I've seen on some of these. And the cyan color here looks nice and bright. I think I need to find a cartridge and plug this in. We'll see if that works. Of course, before I plug in a cartridge though, I'm gonna wanna at least spray some deoxit into that socket there, or the cartridge slots, not socket necessarily. Let's just get some nice bath of deoxit. Can I get my toothbrush down into there? I'm just gonna see if I can scrub that a little bit. How about this one, Radar Rat Race, which is a game I had as a child. It has the most annoying music, which I think people pointed out on one of my previous videos where I showed this cartridge that it's, the music's not even in tune. Okay, let's see if I can even get this into the socket. Oh, these are so hard to connect. Come on, there we go, it's in there. Let's see if this works. Plug in the power. We'll need to connect up a joystick. Deoxic can is leaking everywhere. You know, these deoxic cans aren't the best. Sometimes what I find happens with these deoxic cans is something goes wrong in this mechanism. And when you push on the button here to spray some of the liquid out of here, it does spray, but tons of it builds up in here. And if you tilt the can, it starts leaking out of the can. So it did just leak out like all over this cartridge here. So I'm gonna have to try to clean that up because it can dissolve the adhesive a little bit. I did get some of it in the video socket here in the sound socket, so we plug that in, power this up. What do we get on the monitor? There it is, push F1 to start. Okay, I gotta hook a keyboard up. Let's see if the sound is working. I'm just gonna use the Commodore 64 keyboard. Yes, it is the same. If you didn't realize, it's identical. Press F1 to start. Oh. What happened here? Is there no sound? Or is the game not running? Oh, there we go. Oh dear. Oh, I can't, I thought when I stunned him, that I could actually, um, I could run over him. Oh, this music is, and that, that kills you too. This game is so bad. I have to wonder how much my father paid for this game when I was a kid. And I didn't have that, I think I really didn't have very many cartridge games on my VIC-20, this was one of them. It's such a crappy game, it really is junk. And I used to play it because I didn't really have many. I had, you know, other cassette-based games, but they had to fit within the very small amount of RAM that's on the VIC-20. And this is just, like the sound, you, you can't even turn off the music. Like, what were they thinking? I think I have to eat all the cheese. Oh, great. Okay, I stunned those guys. So I gotta go around. They will wake up again, though. I gotta find the cheese. And there's a little map here to show you like where things are. So there's cheese there. I'm getting chased by the mice, though, or the rats. I'm sorry, they're rats, aren't they? Let's see about this cheese. Come on, come down. 
The, the game mechanics are just frustrating. Oh, I'm out of, oh, there we go. I pushed the fire button, didn't seem to do anything. And the piece of cheese way up there, but there's a rat coming for me. You can see him on the map, there he is. Oh, and I died. Anyhow, there we go. One repaired Commodore VIC-20. Really didn't need much done to it. Just replace the corroded and rusty chips. But what just happened to me where I put the working chips in there and it didn't really work shows you that you do have to be careful about bad contacts in these sockets. I'm not really sure what exactly was happening there because I was probing the enable signal on this one. That was the Motorola chip that was in here. And I, we saw it on the oscilloscope but yet it wasn't really working. But I'm wondering if maybe the VCC or ground pin on the socket wasn't well connected, and that's probably why it was not working well. So I'm gonna write on here number six, because that's kind of what this computer is, right? And it came from Mike. It had bad UD, UD8, UE8, and UF8. And of course it's fixed now. And I'm gonna put 3-2021 as the date. Does kind of go without saying that the rest of this machine is in pretty rough shape and I mean, with the case this yellow, probably is only worth taking it apart, deep cleaning it, maybe spray painting this with the creamy white color again, putting the badges back on, putting the keyboard back on to make a good computer. It's really not a whole lot you can do with the extreme amount of yellowing. That's, that's on this thing. Oh look, the inside of the top is a little closer to the real color. Certainly it's a lot less yellowed than the inside of the bottom cover. I don't really know why the bottom was just so badly affected. So there we go, that's it for this video. Machine number five actually just worked, so I didn't really have to do anything with this nice Rev A machine. So I then added a bonus VIC-20 repair. And yes, don't worry, I've had my tetanus boosters in the last year. So in case I get cut by this rusty metal, I'm not gonna get tetanus. <laughs> this was actually the first time I've ever worked on one of these Rev D machines in my life. My own personal VIC-20 as a kid and every other VIC-20 I own is the earlier style motherboard that's got more chips on it and has a giant heat sink because it takes the nine volt input, which is the only input on it, and it uses linear regulators to convert that down to five volts. So now that I think about it, I assume that the DIN input on here and using the Commodore 64 power supply means that all the circuitry in this natively runs off of five volts from the power supply and the nine volts AC is probably only used for the cassette port because in the VIC-20, the VIC graphics and sound chip only uses five volts. And that's unlike the Commodore 64 where the early VIC-2s use 12 volts and 5 volts, as well as the SID chip. If you enjoyed the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up, but if you didn't, you know what to do, all that youtube -y stuff and subscribe, etc., etc. And I have finally set up Patreon for Adrian's Digital Basement. So if you want to support the channel, you're welcome to do that. There is a link in the description below, and there's also a Patreon link on my channel about page. So that's going to be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye!